very faithful in doing that. And you can head right out the doors and we will uh, delight in giving them the Word of God and some other things at an age and accessibility where they can understand. The rest of us are going to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5 this morning. If you're a regular here, you're expecting me to say Genesis. And we'll, we'll, we'll get back to Genesis eventually, uh, but we'll take a couple weeks off here. Uh, this week we are doing a special emphasis for the kickoff Sunday. Next week we will have with us missionary Tim Watley, who our congregation has supported a long time. He's serving on the field of Peru, and we're very excited to have uh, them with us next week. But we are in Romans chapter 5. In just a moment, uh, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. Following the sermon, some of you are here today to watch a couple of our folks get baptized and added to this congregation. We're very excited about that. That will take place here at the conclusion uh, of the message. Um, one of the traditions we have here is to give God's word. This is what this is. This is the sermon. This is a place where we are not just giving inspirational ideas. We are trying to purposefully explain God's word to you in ways that we can first intellectually understand it, but then we can take its truths and apply them to our hearts, apply them to our lives. So we better know what it is God wants us to do as how he has shown himself. And so if you do need a Bible, if you don't have one, we do have some available. We would love to put one in your hands uh, even before you leave this morning at the Welcome Center. We are in the book of Romans, which is in the New Testament. The, the Bible is divided into two different sections. The predominant section is the Old Testament. Uh, that is the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures originally written in the languages of Hebrew and Aramaic. And then the New Testament, which starts with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, they tell about the life of Jesus uh, from four different perspectives, from four different men uh, who spent time with Christ when he was here on earth. Uh, then we go into the epistles, letters that were written primarily by Paul, but some others as well, uh, as they are sharing with us and explaining the truth, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. That's where we are this morning in the book of Romans, a letter that Paul the apostle wrote to the church in Rome. He had never met them, but they, he knew them by reputation. And so really what the book of Romans is all about, this letter, is explaining to them in great detail, in methodical detail, the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's a word that simply means good news. That Jesus came to this earth, Jesus, the creator of the universe, came to the world as a human being because he understood that when God made us, he had given us expectations. He had given us commandments to follow. And as we've been learning here, as we've been studying Genesis, the, the, the reality is our first parents, Adam and Eve, did not obey God's commandments. In fact, they went very much against God's commandments. They reaped the consequences for that uh, sin, that disobedience, which was death, ultimately, but in, in the, the immediate, it was separation from God. And so, in order to bring us back to a good relationship with our Creator, in order to give us life where there once was death, Jesus, the Creator, came down to earth, lived a sinless life, and died the death, bore the consequences that we deserved on the cross of Calvary, and so that we who believe in Jesus Christ can have salvation, can be forgiven, and have that relationship restored with God. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here this morning in the message that I've entitled The Undesirables. The undesirables will have to do with who we are, but of course we are talking a little bit about football this morning, and we have a tradition not only of of sometimes giving the Word of God, which we always do, but sometimes we also have a little tradition that I like to do called dad jokes. So you'll just have to bear with me if you're, you're not a normal person uh, who regularly attends here. <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you are a normal person who attends here. I don't know. But you'll have to, you'll have to, either way, way you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> so here's a few here for you. Which football player wears the biggest helmet? Well, obviously the one with the biggest head. Where do football players go when they need a new, new uniform? Jim Warrick, you got to know this one. They go to New Jersey. All right. 
What happened when the football coach's dog ran onto the field during a game? He got, of course, called for an ineligible retriever downfield. <laughs> this, one will, this one will hurt some of you here this morning. What do you call 20 Minnesota Viking fans in the basement? A wine cellar. <laughs> Is Will Harris out in the foyer? Yeah. Will, all right, this one's for you, man. <laughs> What do you call 53 millionaires around a TV watching the Super Bowl? Of course, it's the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> All right. What happened to the joke the quarterback told his players? It, it went over their heads. <laughs> and finally, mercifully for us here this morning, what is the football player's favorite ice cream? Well, of course, it's any given Sunday. All right. So, we're talking, the message is entitled, The Undesirables. And that's probably, uh, you've heard of Brock Purdy, who's the, the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. He's an alumnus of Iowa State University back there, Jim Wyrick again. Uh, but he was known by another nickname before he achieved success on the field. Anybody know what that nickname was? Mr. Irrelevant. How did he earn that nickname? Because he had the ignominious... Uh, privilege, I don't know, I suppose. He, he had this thrust upon him. He was the last player taken in the draft that year. He was the very last player taken in the draft. And of course, he's gone on to achieve quite a bit of success. He jumped over Jimmy Garoppolo. He jumped over Trey Lance, who was from Minnesota, so that hurts us a little bit, but you understand how that is. And he has gotten success, taken them to the Super Bowl. He, he's, he's done far better. He's overachieved, and it's been a great story. We like stories like that. Tom Brady, my, my guy. I didn't wear my Patriots jersey this morning, but you, you can thank my, my son's wearing one here for me. <laughs> but Tom Brady, that was a story, among other things. Not, no, not because he deflated the football. Well, we're not going to go there. But he was this, taken in the sixth round. He was the 199th player taken before he went on to achieve his success. But those players were drafted. What do these people have in common? Tony Romo, Wes Welker, Adam Vinatieri, Warren Moon, Kurt Warner, some of you will recognize this name, John Randall. What do those people have in common? None of them were drafted. All of them had to make the team as undrafted people going into the tryouts. They had to overcome even more, not just the, the indignity of being low draft picks, they had to succeed and prove themselves. So, John Randall, of course, many of you will remember him. He played during the, the Randy Moss era. I think I saw a Randy Moss jersey over here somewhere. Uh, Amy Call, where are you? I saw a Randy Moss. She's back there, okay. But she was singing with us in the choir this morning. And Randy Moss was that era. But John Randall was your defensive standout during that time. Made several all-pros. All, uh, he was several all-league. He, he, was, he was at the height of his game. Uh, Brett Favre was not a big fan of John Randall, as I'm told. Uh, and yet, he went undrafted. His older brother played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and so they decided after, out of college they were going to give him a tryout, and they said, no, he's too small. He is 6'2", 244 pounds, and that's just not big enough for the league. That's not big enough for a defensive tackle. Uh, the, the, the head scout at the time for the Vikings watched the tryout and says, you know, our team ought to give him a try. And so he was told he would be given an opportunity, but we're not going to let you make the team unless you weigh in at 250 or more. So Randall, hearing that as the story goes, put a pair of sweatpants on and hid a chain in his sweatpants so that he could make the team. And of course, the rest is history. He went on to be an all-pro receiver. He went on to be uh, the 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 the. the the nightmares of, of Brett Favre and others that, that he chased around the field and went on to great success. And we like stories like that. We like stories like Kurt Warner, the guy who's taken his team to the Super Bowl and winning MVPs and just a few years ago was bagging groceries at the hy V. Those are great stories. The Cinderella, somebody who comes in and defies the odds, overcomes adversity, and achieves success. But even in these stories we're telling you, 
nobody gets these chances to succeed without being given an opportunity. Where does Tom Brady's career go if Drew Bledsoe doesn't get injured and taken out of the game against the Jets? What happens to Kurt Warner if Trent Green stays healthy? Where is John Randall if that scouting guy, Don Dyche, doesn't give him the shot? They have to have that opportunity to succeed, to take a hold of that window that's been given to them. And really, if we like that kind of a Cinderella story, overcoming the odds, being a success where it wasn't expected, where all the odds were against us, friend, you should understand that when we talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ a few moments ago, Christianity is really that kind of a story when it comes to how our relationship with God is. Christianity is all people who have no hope overcoming the odds and becoming a success and it's because Jesus Christ gave us the opportunity to do so. And that's what we're going to read about here this morning in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. That means there are different English translations of the Bible, and the English Standard Version is one of them. So I'm clarifying for you, if you ever go to look for a Bible, you're going to find that there's a lot of different translations Popular ones include the King James Version, which is the old standby, uses some of the these and thous, but still a very accurate, very reliable translation. A lot of Christians have grown up on that. There's the new King James Version that tries to update the grammar a little bit. The ESV would kind of be along that vein, the New International Version. We're reading this morning from the English Standard Version. I'll read verses 1 through 8 of Romans chapter 5. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have access, uh, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is God's Word, inerrant, infallible, inspired, and written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the Lord Jesus Christ. May God add His blessing here to the reading of His Word this morning. If you have that paper bulletin, the worship guide that maybe somebody handed you as you came in this morning, on the back side there is an outline. If you'd like to use that to follow along and explain a little bit about where the sermon is going, the points we're going to try to emphasize out of this text this morning, that point, it says again, the undesirables, people like us, coming to Jesus with no deserving, no opportunity of our own, the opportunity that Jesus has given to us. The first point that we're going to take from the text this morning is that Jesus is the one who secures our victory. Jesus secures our victory. How does he do that? First of all, he gives us access to God. It says in the first two verses, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we as human beings who have believed in him have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I want to focus, first of all, on that phrase, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. Peace can mean a lot of different things in the Bible. Peace can sometimes be talking about the calmness, the serenity. Paul will talk about, uh, I think, to the Philippians where he says, that the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. That is, when you find yourself worked up and anxious, afraid, insecure, God can give you a sense of calmness. He can quiet your heart. 
giving you comfort, giving you confidence and strength when you're going through a difficult time. That's not the kind of peace that's being talked about here. Not calmness and serenity, though though God does give us that. What the kind of peace is it's talking about here is like the kind of peace that there was when Brett Favre, who had spent all his career in a Green, Green Bay Packers jersey, came over, and remember that year, folks, where they, went, they almost went, they went to the title game, they almost went to the Super Bowl, but who brought you there? It was the same guy wearing a purple jersey. And suddenly, all of you who had rooted against him all that time were big Brett Favre fans, because he's one of us. The hostilities had ceased. The peace was there. There was a change in the relationship. And that's really what we're talking about here. Not about football, but that God, who was our enemy, we were opposed to him and he to us. He, because he is a holy, righteous, perfect God, and we, who had gone against what he wanted us to do, We had gone against his commandments. We had rebelled against him. He gave us peace. Jesus came to bear the consequences and bring two parties who were separated at odds with one another, hostile towards one another, and brought them together. We have peace with God, and we do that through Jesus Christ, through what he has done. John 14, 6, this is how Jesus himself put it when he was here on earth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is, you can't repair the relationship on your own. There's too much going against you. You have broken the law, and you must bear the consequences. But I have taken care of that. It's it's like if we want to think of it this way. There was a fine. There was a debt that we owed that we didn't have the capability of to pay on our own. And the only way that we were going to do that is with our lives. That, that's the consequences of sin. Because the wages of sin, as Paul will say actually in the next chapter, is death. That's what we deserved. But Jesus died that death that we deserved. He paid the debt so that we could have peace with God. How do we get that peace with God? How does that debt get paid? This is what Paul says here in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 5 as well. Because we have been justified, how? By faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus himself would say again in the, the very well-known verse that even many people who aren't faithful Christians would know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting eternal life you won't die you will have life if you believe on jesus this word justified means that god declares you who are guilty you deserve this consequences he says you are good you are righteous i look at what your record shows and i don't see what you have done anymore Instead, I see the perfection, the clean record of Jesus Christ. And that applies to you. You would think of it this way. He doesn't see your credit card statement with all these things that have been gone unpaid and they're, they're ready to shut you down and turn off your utilities and everything. He sees the no outstanding balance. He sees that Jesus Christ has limitless capabilities pay that off for you and leave you clean leave you with no problems to have to take care of that's what it means when we say that god gives us access through jesus christ into the grace into the gift that he has given to us that you couldn't buy for yourself jesus gives you access to god he gives you a clean record once you have believed on jesus we see next that God gives us, through Jesus Christ, strength. He supplies us with strength. We keep reading in Romans chapter 5, picking up in verse 3. We are rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. End of verse 2. Not only that, 
but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and that endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The idea of the difficulties that we will go through in life, what we talked about just a moment ago when we were trying to distinguish the kinds of peace that we can experience, this kind of peace is through times of challenge, times of worry, fear, anxiety, pain, and suffering. God can give us that kind of strength. God supplies us with that kind of endurance. One of the verses that we sometimes talk about when it comes to athletics and and overcoming things is you will hear a lot of Christians say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And maybe they're thinking, I can win the Super Bowl. I I can be the fastest runner. I can do this or that. But when you listen to the context, it's not strength to do impossible things that we maybe couldn't do otherwise. It's the strength to outlast some of the challenges that would maybe put us aside, put us down, make us feel like we can't go on. That's what he's talking about here, that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. That we don't quit. We don't give up. We keep on going. This is how the Apostle Paul puts it when he wrote his letter to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11. As he's talking to his audience, he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, For I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I'm happy. I'm satisfied no matter if there's a good situation going, a favorable situation, or one that's not really that pleasant. I can keep my faith strong. He says, I know how to be brought low, verse 12, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Then he says, I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. That is, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be persistent. And why am I going to do that? Because Jesus is the one who enables me to do so. He's the one who's given me the opportunity to succeed. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament says in Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 21, Speaking first of the glory and the strength of God, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He's trying to give us the scale. We as people are small, tiny, insignificant. God is great and powerful. When we had vacation Bible school, This summer, our children learned that I, my God is so big, yeah, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And it's taken from passages like this. God is strong. We are like grasshoppers. And God brings princes to nothing, makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them. And they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. You notice, even as you drive through this in Minnesota this time of year, there's still a lot of green out there, but it's not all green. You're starting to see some of those leaves turn red, some of those leaves turn yellow. Anybody got any brown leaves on their lawn yet? Probably not quite, but I've heard a few people talking about how uh, trees are starting to drop already. And that's kind of what he's talking about, the change of seasons. Not everything lasts, but God and His strength lasts forever. Verse 25, To whom then will you compare me that I should be like Him, says the Holy One, says God? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of His might, and because He is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? And my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. So this is who God is. This is his capabilities. But what does that mean to us? Keep reading. Because that same God who has unlimited power, unlimited capabilities, beyond what we can fathom, gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God supplies you with strength beyond what your capabilities are. When you run out, God's gifts... God's strength is just getting started. I remember as I was a child growing up in churches like this one, one of the songs that uh, a man used to sing in our church when he sang a special uh, number, a, a solo, it says, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, God gives and gives and gives again. He never is out. He always has exactly what we need. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. Friends, God gives you that strength in the face of of tragedy. How can we go on when we have lost someone so dear to us and, and it feels like the pain will never go away? The emptiness will never be filled. Friend, know that God gives you the strength to work through that pain. He doesn't always promise to take it away, but He promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. He will give you the strength to endure. He will give you the strength to persevere. He can help you when you're struggling with addiction, when you don't know how to get over that destructive behavior in your life. And it feels like you just can't say no. It feels like you're a slave to that. God can give you the strength to say no. He can give you the encouragement you need to keep on going when you've caved in, when you've given in to that destructive behavior, to that sinful habit. Jesus says, you're mine, and I can help you start over. I can give you the strength to go on. That's what we're talking about. It's not just a feeling, not just a positive thing. It's realizing that in the weak moments of your life, Jesus is there. Jesus is faithful. And so we tell you this this morning, and Paul tells his audience this, so that we can build your confidence. We keep reading in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died died for us. So in your weakest moment, in your most profound expression of your incapability, what did Jesus do? He saw what you could not produce for yourself, and he gave himself as a sacrifice to provide for you what you couldn't do for yourself. So why would we ever think that God isn't going to be there for us in our times where we're struggling with a destructive habit, in those times where it feels like that hole of pain and vacancy will never be filled, in those times where it feels like our marriage is just going to collapse and, and not be there, and, and, and how is God ever going to help me recover from all the, the broken pieces, the shattered dreams and expectations that now that I have to face. How am I going to get through that? 
This is what we're reminded of. If God is for us, who can be against us? He is going to give you help. He is going to give you grace in your time of need. We read this morning from Hebrews chapter 10, thinking about how Jesus' blood gives us that kind of access to God. But he says there at the end of the chapter, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are those who have faith. We have confidence in God, and He is going to preserve. He is going to save our souls. He is going to see us through to the end. You can have that kind of confidence, because He has promised, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. And He calls you, friend, to see who He is, to see what He has done. And the next point on your outline is to believe. I want you to believe in two things out of this passage this morning. First of all, believe in the work that Jesus has done on your behalf. Again, Jesus, quoting from John chapter 10 and verse 9, says these words, I am the door. What does he mean by that? Does he mean that he's flat and straight and has a knob? No. He means that he's the one who gives you that access. We already said Jesus says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying, I'm the access point. I'm what lets you get in. I'm the one who gives you the opportunity to come in and out. And he says, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Pasture for a sheep is where they eat. It's where they get the sustenance that are needed for them to survive and to thrive and to grow. Jesus is all about seeing you succeed seeing you overcome the weight, the pain, the anxiety that you face on a daily basis, and to give you the hope of eternal life when this life ends and we pass on into eternity. He is the one who gives you that certainty. And friend, it's because you go in and out through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross so you could have that kind of access, so you could have that kind of confidence. He did the work so that you could have the worth. And that's the second point that I want you to believe on. Not feeling that you can do anything on your own. It's not building up our own confidence, our own reputation. It's because of what he has done. Again, Paul in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 3. Paul says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in in the flesh. What he's trying to say with the circumcision thing, just to not belabor that point, but that's, that's a ritual that the Jewish people would do. And the Jewish people often put confidence in the fact that they were Jewish, that they were different than everybody else. They were superior to everybody else because of their ethnicity and because of their religious traditions and heritages and rituals. Paul says that's not where our confidence should be. Our confidence is nothing that we do. Our confidence is instead in Jesus Christ. But he says, if you really want to go through a list of what people can do to accomplish this, to be confident in themselves, keep reading. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. And so then he starts to go through a list of all his achievements. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. So by the, by the time I was born, by, before I was a week old, I'd already had this done. I had my, my ritual completed. I was, I was in. That was what gave me the good standing with God. Right from my earliest days, I have the right pedigree. He says, I've been of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I can go all the way tracing my, my, my ancestry back. I am of the right stock. God should look at me and my ethnicity and say, he's one of the ones that I really value. As to, um, as to the law, a Pharisee, and so he's gone and gotten the right religious training, and he's kept all of these laws. He's kept all the rules. I've not only kept the Ten Commandments, I've done all this other stuff too that shows that I have value. I've been a good person. As to zeal, verse 6, a persecutor of the church. And so, if you look in the Apostle Paul's history, what does he do? He is a religious Jewish zealot 
and he is ready to take on, to the point of physical violence, anybody else who is opposing their teachings. You kind of think of what we might say today, the, the fundamentalists who go and fly themselves into buildings and blow people up because of their, the fervor of their beliefs. It's almost the kind of person that Paul is trying to portray himself as here. I, I take this seriously. And I should win God's favor because of who I am and what I have done. But, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless, but whatever gain I had, verse 7, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish. They are to be discarded. They are to be thrown away in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes by the law. In other words, there's nothing good enough for me to do to earn God's favor. What gives me worth? What gives me value? It's that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. You have to keep believing not in yourself, because if you believe in yourself, you're going to let yourself down. It's never going to be good enough. John Randall, if we go back to the illustration at the opening, could have, he, he pushed. He wanted to get tried. He, he did everything he could. He put the chains in his sweatpants, right? If, if the story is correct. But none of those things were going to get him in if the scout hadn't said, we need to give him a chance. The scout had to be the one who said, I see something in this guy. I need to give, we need to give him an opportunity. Now, Randall had to prove himself, sure. It's worse for us. Because if we have to prove ourselves, not a single one of us is going to make it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They're going to pull out the sweatpants and see the chain, friends. We're not going to be good enough. We're not going to make it. But Jesus is the one who we believe in. Jesus is the one who says, not that I see the potential. I see what I can do with him. I can give him life. I can make him something that he couldn't have been without me. But I can make him the kind of person who is going to let my glory shine in him. I can supply him with the strength to accomplish what he or she could not on their own. He gives us hope. He takes the point I really want you to remember, if you remember nothing else from this sermon, is that Jesus turns the weaklings into winners. He takes us who couldn't do anything for ourselves and makes us into new creatures in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You have a new hope, a new life, a new future, new capabilities. If you turn from you and your hopelessness and embrace and believe in Jesus Christ, friend, there would be nothing better you could do to kick off a new life, to start a new season with Him in the driver's seat, with him giving you strength, with him giving you hope. Friend, don't leave here today without the hope of knowing Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the life that you have promised to us who believe. That, Lord, we can come to you knowing that he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. But when we believe, you have promised to erase our past. You've promised to give us life. You've promised to give us hope and eternity in heaven with you. You've promised that nothing will ever separate us from your love. We thank you, Father, for the promises that you have given to us, the opportunity, the window of belief that we have to exercise. And Lord, if there's one here today who has not done that, work in their hearts, work in their lives to help them to see that now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time where they need to believe. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.